Hello and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we take a look at today's news, views, trends, and opinions from a decidedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Shane Patrick Connolly, and your show is brought to you by the Liberty Forum. The Liberty Forum meets the second Tuesday of every month in Mountain View. My guest today is Brandon Lang. He's a recent graduate of the University of California at Santa Cruz. And he is a conservative leader both on campus and throughout the state. And so welcome, Brandon. Thank you for having me, Shane. Thank you for joining us today. Um, now, you grew up here in the Bay Area, correct? Mm -hmm. Redwood City. In Redwood City. OK, so we're in the bastion of uh, you know, the uh, political left, I guess you would say, here. And uh, how is it that someone who grew up in this environment uh, came to conservatism? Well. Growing up in Redwood City, um, I was never really too involved in politics throughout my upbringing, you know, though it is in one of the most democratic-leaning areas in the entire country, I think uh, plus 46 blue or something like that. Um, but my mom took a very hands-off approach in upbringing me and my little brother, Bryce, uh, so we were pretty much left to our own devices and figuring out where we, where we uh, fall on different matters. Uh, so. In looking at politics, it was never much of an interest throughout uh, much of childhood. Of course, why should a child be involved, interested in politics? So I met a few people who are like that. But regardless, um, we, I never really got interested until about high school, uh, especially after seeing uh, Romney's campaign going along. I, I admittedly did not like Romney that much. I still found uh, national politics to be quite captivating. Um, but throughout my throughout my childhood and then becoming a young adult, I became very interested in freedom of speech and especially uh, gun rights, uh, which the latter was not exactly that, uh, that uh, liked by my mom because she wasn't exactly a fan of firearms, but uh, it was something that I became very interested in as a hobby. Mm -hmm. So although we'll have our, uh, our, our disagreements and at times arguments about things, especially now, uh, it's, it was never that much of a problem. So that sounds great. She gave you a lot of freedom to uh, come to your own conclusions. And uh, it just so happened that you fell onto uh, the conservative side of, of these, these uh, freedom issues, right? Yeah. So, so um, that, that's a great. Would you, how would you describe yourself uh, in terms of your political philosophy? Uh, I tend to like the term classical liberal in its usage of, well, more description of the founding fathers and someone like John Stuart Mill's or potentially Milton Friedman. I find Milton Friedman to be quite captivating in his ideas as an economist and also just as a general uh, philosopher, if you will. But um, I used to identify him more along the lines of uh, libertarian. But then in uh, talking to people and finding out more about the political parties themselves, uh, I didn't find the libertarian party to be all that uh, captivating, both in its unity of message and its uh, practicality. But along the way, I found that the Republican Party has been uh, a, lot more, a lot more interesting. Um, and following the uh, candidacy and then election of Donald Trump, uh, I found that to be, something to be something to be pretty excited for and got me a lot more involved along the way. Now, so you did get very involved. And on your campus, I know that you were involved in leadership and um, really had a, um, I understand, a, a dynamic group of students uh, there. What was your organization on campus, and, and what was your involvement in it? Uh, so I was the president of the College Republicans at UC Santa Cruz for the last two years, uh, having just graduated in June. Uh, it's fallen into new leadership, which I'm very hopeful for uh, in the coming futures. They have very big ideas. But regardless, uh, the group there had only just started in 2017, or I should say the end of 2016, but I wasn't involved yet because the group had basically fallen to the wayside and eventually became defunct in, uh, I believe, 2015 hmm. after basically becoming reclusive and uh, 
losing the moniker of college Republicans and I believe taking on the moniker of the King of the Hill Club for watching the show King of the Hill <laughs> instead of engaging in politics. Okay, it became a social club. Yeah, it became more of a, a, yeah, more of a social club. club. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after the election of Donald Trump, uh, things became a little bit more hyper on my campus in terms of politics, of course. And now, UC Santa Cruz, not known as a conservative campus by any means, right? No, not, not by any means at all. It is considered to be the most left-leaning campus in the entirety of the United States, actually, according to U.S. rankings, uh, multiple rankings, actually. Interesting. Yeah. So what kind of appeal would a conservative organization have on your campus, especially well, in the era of you know, uh, very polarized politics, uh, Trump, uh, AOC, and people like that? Well, ironically enough, engagement in political parties on the campus has never been, at least when I started, didn't seem to be that big of a thing. But with the upcoming uh, election back in 2016, things began to be very heated. Uh, I think a lot of people would agree that culture became very, culture in the United States and especially in California and even most especially on college campuses became very, uh, very fiery uh, to a lot of people and it became mm -hmm. extremely polarizing. And so, with that polarization uh, in, an, in, a, uh, in a place where there is a, an effective hegemony of ideas that are accepted, in UC Santa Cruz's case, uh, a left-wing hegemony, uh, there comes a, essentially a counterculture where people will, want, will have ideas such as um, having, uh, having respect for the United States for one thing can seem to be a, uh, an idea or a principle that is not seen as welcome to everyone on the campus. But regardless, there becomes, there becomes a, a culture that grows in response to uh, the lacking discussion going on. Now, do you see the, the millennials, I guess you would be the post-millennials, but uh, being more liberal and uh, kind of a backlash to that on your campus or, or a desire for alternate um, viewpoints to be heard that, that you're seeing in your generation? Mm -hmm. uh, millennials are usually described as, and according to many polls and research, are seen as like the most left-leaning generation so far. Mm -hmm. But depending on how it's defined, uh, I would identify with uh, Generation Z, which is the next one coming up. Uh, you begin to see a bit of a pendulum shift in identifying as um, fiscally conservative, but uh, more socially liberal but generally seeing a bit more of a conservative leaning as opposed to the uh, general trend that's been going on for the past few decades. So it's created a pretty interesting scenario on campuses with at times younger people going up against slightly older people uh, in hmm. bringing up conservative views to liberal views. It's interesting, so the, the baby boomers and, and folks who are now in control on the campus and for folks in our audience who may have lived through the 60s. The counterculture then uh, is now the establishment at many universities, mm -hmm. most universities probably. And uh, so the counterculture to that is, is conservative students. Um, that's a really interesting uh, transformation that's occurred. Now, um, what methods do you use to reach students on your campus and get a conservative message out to people uh, as uh, through your organization and uh, well, in our practice, we tried to be as visible as we could. That meant uh, not hiding behind uh, closed doors and ha hosting our meetings. We were always open to everyone who wished to come in the door. Uh, if we want to regrow a conservative movement in this state, we have to be willing to pitch a wide tent, have an open door for people, and then help guide them uh, in figuring out who they are as preferably conservatives, but that could be libertarians, but ultimately bring in anyone. And for us, we saw good success in that in changing several Democrats and, moder and several Democrats and um, uh, independent uh, people who registered as independents, uh, even one Green Party person, but that's, uh, that's still a work in progress. But we were always visible. Uh, we were as, I don't want to say upfront is the wrong word, but more uh, willing to engage with people in open form as we could, uh, such as tabling. Uh, out in our open areas and hosting events, especially speaker events, 
uh, which usually brought in pretty good crowds. Uh, however, that <laughs> opened the door, of course, for some uh, interesting incidents with people who were not so welcome to that. <laughs> now, um, we know that on campuses throughout uh, the United States, uh, there have been certain conservative speakers who've kind of been a lightning rod for the far left, and they have tried to shout them down. They've tried to prevent these speakers from uh, exercising their freedom of speech and the people who want to see them from exercising their freedom of assembly, right? Mm -hmm. So um, how, how was your experience at UC Santa Cruz? Did you find it to be a hostile environment? Was it friendly? Uh, a mixed bag? <laughs> well, it definitely leans on the more hostile side. However, there is a good deal of nuance to it. Uh, in my time there, we hosted, God, probably over a couple dozen speakers, um, many of which not very controversial, um, most of which controversial to the person that you're talking, depending on the person you're talking to. Um, the biggest people that we had were uh, Christina Hoff Sommers of the American Enterprise Institute, a notable, fem notable feminist writer and actually Democrat, but still has uh, views that are considered to be uh, not welcome by uh, people on the left. And also uh, David Horowitz of the David Horowitz Freedom, Freedom Center, prolific writer, um, oftentimes on Fox News. Uh, that, uh, that, drew a, that, that drew a pretty big uh, fire response. But in, in our time there, we only ever had one protest, which is an odd thing. Uh, I like to say that we have the most radically left-wing campus in terms of their politics, but uh, very sedated in their action or their will willingness to take action. It might be something that in the air. I, I, I don't know about it. But, uh, <laughs> Maybe being near the ocean keeps yeah. you a little more uh, calm. Yeah, the ocean. I think that's it. <laughs> so uh, what, are, what do you feel that the students in your cohort are, are interested in? Uh, what, what, are, what are their concerns? Uh, of issues of national import today? Well, in terms of national import, uh, I have found that finding a national identity has been a pretty big commonality with people who come into my group and others. Um, having, an, having this sense of being an American is very important to people now. Um, now, does in terms that appeal of, a lot to uh, immigrants? Uh, do, do you have Especially a immigrants especially immigrants. Um, I, I actually had a, a member that was a DACA student who was in support of Trump. Mm, interesting. <laughs> yeah, and wanted to be an American. So that was, that was, a, that was a very common big deal for people. Mm -hmm. So immigration, of course, is uh, following that, uh, following nationalism is a pretty big issue for people, just on the national front. Um, in terms of local issues, uh, more California-based issues, Finding jobs and uh, cost of housing are another big thing, but the national politics are always the things that spark the biggest response to people, or that be, uh, as stated, like finding a national, defining Americanism or a national identity, immigration, gun rights, abortion, what have you. Right. So those hot button issues may get the hot them stuff. in the door, right? And then, uh, are you have you been able to engage them in local activities? Uh, to help, uh, because that's where mm -hmm. a difference can be made uh, more so than on, than on the national scene. Yeah, somewhat. Santa Cruz is kind of a tough nut to crack in that it is a pretty left-wing uh, controlled area. I know that uh, Ashley Scontriano on the previous show talked about it a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we currently have a couple people on the city council which are uh, very left-leaning and are seen as uh, not particularly not especially uh, desirable by a good portion of the community. Um, but the city has had a very left wing, very left wing control for a good while. But that doesn't mean that we haven't been able to at least try to affect local politics in some way. We had a um, we had a local measure there to establish rent control and just cause eviction measure M, which we tabled on uh, in order to get the word out on campus about why rent control is not a good thing, mm -hmm. despite uh, the socialists on campus, uh, the Democratic Socialists of America specifically, and uh, one of the city council members, or current city council members, uh, coming on to campus to talk about why they should be in support of rent control. But we, to the best of our efforts, try to inform people uh, in the open areas at our meetings and uh, in, in other places, such as an open forum that was 
um, that was hosted on campus between the economics department and the sociology department, uh, which uh, went pretty interestingly, but pretty effectively overall. Uh, yeah, about so you the have issue. been successful in, in, in connecting people from these national hotbed issues, but then down to the practical politics of, of local grassroots activism, I guess mm -hmm. you'd say, right? Yeah, where we can, we have tried to push. And yeah. that measure specifically failed. I, I, I believe it was 63% to like 30%. That's that, great. And, that and so well. you've defeated it in, in the uh, bastion of liberalism in, in Santa Cruz. Of course, the legislature, ignoring previous votes of the people statewide and in local communities, mm. they're imposing rent control now. Yeah. Um, so obviously, we have a lot of work to do in California. And uh, with their you know, mega majorities that the Democrats have and liberals have in Sacramento, um, it, it's definitely uh, something that needs to be overcome. And so we look forward to having uh, you, you and your fellow students continue to be engaged. Yeah, it will, it will take issues. a long time. It will <laughs> take a long time, but not for lack of trying, we are going to continue trying to change the state back to the way that it was. Now, speaking yeah. of the state, you uh, also are involved in a statewide organization, right? And mm -hmm. I think you're the Bay Area yeah. chair or vice chair, I think, vice chair for the Bay Area. Yeah, so I'm the uh, Bay Area vice chair for the California Federation of College Republicans. Okay. Uh, we're a newly established uh, statewide organization uh, that just got chartered with the California Republican Party. Uh, okay. Our primary concerns are grassroots efforts in uh, activism, uh, well, campus activism primarily, and statewide deployments for uh, congressional campaigns, uh, both statewide and but mostly statewide. But yeah, yeah, I, and I know that in the upcoming election cycle, there'll be a lot of focus on congressional seats. Mm -hmm. um, there were several incumbents that were um, turned out of office in the last uh, election cycle, um, with uh, particularly. Um, the Democrats using ballot harvesting techniques and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so will the, will the college uh, Republican Federation be working on things like that uh, to, to kind of even the playing field? Diligently, yes. We're working on, uh, currently we're working on a voter, voter registration drive okay. uh, going past September surge that the California Republican Party is doing. We're on our own thing for that. And we are currently looking at creating uh, deployment plans for moving people from colleges at various parts of the state to uh, targeted districts. Oh, so that's in development. Yeah. Very, good. <laughs> Very good. Well, it sounds like you guys are thoroughly engaged in what's going on, both locally and at the state level. And uh, what, are, what are the benefits? And I guess that's one of them right there. Uh, what are the other benefits of having a statewide network of conservatives? Um, that you said the word right there, networking. Being able to get in touch with people from different parts of the state which might have connections to either political people or uh, business people that you might not. Or the statewide organization, we're able to provide a fantastic support network in that. Uh, and it's, it can be a very important resource in uh, coordinating get-togethers for people who might not think that there are as many uh, conservatives in their area or the state at large, uh, people who just share the same interests. It's very reassuring for one thing as an initial part, but then after that, being able to come together to strategize and figure out how we're going to actually make an impactful difference in the state uh, becomes very important in the long term. Yeah, so that kind of a petri dish of ideas is, is, is larger and, and you can get uh, good synergies from that. and. Uh, and come up with uh, best practices, right? So mm -hmm. uh, if you guys are doing something great in Santa Cruz, uh, you're able to uh, import it to, uh, I don't know, uh, UCLA or, or somewhere else. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, how many campuses are you, are you active? Is the organization active on? Uh, we currently have 27 chapters uh, throughout, the, throughout the state. And we are currently working on bringing in uh, many more. Uh, I myself have charted out a uh, three or three campuses throughout the Bay Area, which are uh, going to be uh, chartered preferably within the next year. But I'm working on getting contacts, um, uh, getting a co getting contacts at other schools in the area, uh, whereas people in the organization are working on their own campuses throughout the state. Mm -hmm. Now, where do you get resources to undertake uh, some of these kinds of efforts? Um, are there 
foundations out there that help support your work or, uh, you know, what's the conservative infrastructure that, that helps this happen? Well, there are private donors, of course, um, but primarily uh, GOP committees in different counties. There's the College Republican National Committee, which helps out with um, which helps out with coordination and giving out uh, chapter boxes for tabling supplies, basically, and helping to attract people. Um, but um, there's various donors that we get st that we can get uh, funding from. How about when you bring out speakers? Um, have you sought out grants, or how, how does that work? Now, there's organizations that uh, various groups across campuses are able to uh, that groups across campuses are able to work with. Uh, there's uh, the Young Americas Foundation, there's a Leadership Institute, and uh, I, myself, and other organizations have worked uh, with other uh, conservative-leaning organizations on campus uh, to uh, bring speakers from organizations that are uh, non-political, uh, well, such as Leadership Institute, but mm -hmm. there's various ways to do it. Um, a lot of schools do have, some schools do have money specifically set off for uh, campus organizations to help them out with uh, putting on those events. Uh, others, you might have to go through student union uh, student union assemblies to petition for that. That's the way my school worked. Uh, okay. We were very successful in getting money from them, uh, mm -hmm. given that uh, we have to present to them. But we found our ways around that. But there's there's various methods to doing it. There's processes and organizations that are willing to help. Now, what are some of the challenges uh, of of putting on? events and, and uh, campuses across California. Um, are administrations supportive? Are they uh, hostile? Because um, uh, sometimes we've heard stories of, of uh, you know, administrators that don't want trouble on their campus, mm. or so they say, and so that squelches free speech. But um, was your campus reasonable to work with, and how are, you, how are people finding the other campuses around? Well, in my, in my experience, our campus administrators try to come off as neutral whenever they could. Um, in order to bring on speakers, at times it became very, uh, very difficult and very frustrating because the way that our school was set up was such that it was just a very, very long process. So like the moment uh, someone from a department found that a speaker that we might bring on is, could bring on any kind of uh, response in the form of a protest, we would have to look into bringing on security. Mm. That's not really something of our organizations, such as the College Democrats, although they weren't super active, or ironically enough, or uh, MS and the Muslim Student Association, Black Student Union, what have you, would have to go through or would have to uh, put up with. It. But in our attempts to bring speakers on, there was usually the caveat of saying, oh, this person is likely going to elicit a response, and so we're going to have to, you're going to have to prepare for security, which will give you another month or so in planning. Okay. So, you know, just a little more time for logistics, but otherwise they were fairly cooperative, and uh, that's, that's good to hear, that uh, they're at least uh, remain committed to free speech on yeah. campus. Uh, I know it was um, not always the case at UC Berkeley where they tried to impose just exorbitant fees uh, on any conservative organization that tried to bring uh, speakers. Yeah, massive security fees that came out of nowhere, essentially. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're, we're getting down to the last few minutes of our show, and I'd like to hear some more about, well, uh, having understood that you just recently graduated, right? Uh, w what did you actually study? Um, was it political science? No, I, I wanted a job, but ironically enough, it's still kind of hard to find a job <laughs> outside of college. Uh, I studied economics and technology information management, which is a, kind of a catch-all term that's similar to like business systems or data science. Okay. So I was mostly interested in uh, economic theory and uh, behavior, but then I became more interested in finance over time, especially in the last couple of years. So I'm trying to... I, I'm. I'm passionate about politics and would like to be involved in politics. However, in terms of a, a career capacity, I'm more geared towards uh, financial analysis, such as uh, private equity investments or uh, financial planning analysis. Okay, so if there's anyone yeah. in our audience who needs somebody who's really sharp and a great organizer, uh, <laughs> talk to uh, Brandon. Um, we'll make sure his contact information is available, right? That'd be appreciated. <laughs> um, 
so, well, thank you very much for uh, your insights today. Uh, if you wanted to leave us with a last thought about uh, how best to reach uh, your generation, um, what, do you, what do you suggest? Well, uh, California is, an in, is in an interesting spot right now, and things seem bleak to a lot of people. Uh, I know a lot of people who've wanted to move out of the state because it just seems like it's not going to go well for the next few years or so at least. But I'm, I'm not one of those people. I, I love this place. I don't want to see it go down any, any bad turns anymore. But it's going to take a lot of work. And I, I think that that, starts, that, the ch that change starts with capturing and um, uh, fostering young, young conservative minds. And the best place for that is to help on college campuses where we can, where something like my organization, the California, Col California Federation of College Republicans can make a difference. It's mm -hmm. just going to take time and very concerted effort, but I'm looking to help with that. And I know a lot of people who are willing to. So. Excellent, that's, that's fantastic. And uh, some good advice for us to uh, kind of wrap up your thinking around this. And I think that California presents a great opportunity I think here we've seen the failures of uh, the modern left uh, in increasing homelessness, increasing uh, addiction, uh, mental illness on uh, people on our streets, hmm. uh, increasing crime with some of the poorly thought out criminal justice reforms that, that they implemented. So I think it is uh, time is ripe, uh, as people have seen these failures, to uh, give them a message of hope and of uh, freedom and, con and, and conservative values that, that can make a difference in our state. Mm -hmm. So thank you very, very much, much for, uh, for those insights today. No, thank you for having me. Thank you. So coming up, uh, our sponsor, the Liberty Forum, uh, they meet the second Tuesday of every month, except certain months when they are going to meet the third Tuesday. Uh, they meet at the IFES Hall on 432 Stirling Road in Mountain View. In October, the guest is Candace Owens. She's nationally known, uh, a commentator from Turning Point USA, and also famous in the Walk Away movement. In November, they'll have John Miller, director of the Dow Journalism Program at Hillsdale College. And that's what's coming up at the uh, Liberty Forum, so please check out those programs. And they're online as well. And thank you very much for joining us today. And so now we can just...